I'm resident of Collinwood, and joining me, author of the Dark Shadows Day book, Patrick McRae. Man, how are you? You know what I just figured out this week in a day book I didn't write, but I really need to, uh, was um, because we had this week, we had the anniversary of, uh, uh, which strangely enough, it's an anniversary that happens every year, of Quentin uh, figuring out uh, about, you know, averting his death and Potofi helping him avert his death and Julian Barnabas. I think it, maybe it was the episode today, because uh, even if I don't write a day book every day, <laughs> um, I still watch an episode every day. Right. And uh, filmed on that day, and uh, it, it's where Julian Barnabas say, "Hey, you know, you've got something that few men get, uh, which is uh, you know a, a contract for another six weeks." But you know, but but you know, the, you, you've got a new lease on life, and uh, God, something's great in that. But, you know, I figured something out because yesterday, which is the episode right before that, where the death almost happens, where death almost shoots him, right. uh, is Jameson's last episode. And so it's where he's trying to make up with Jameson and work all of that out. And, you know, Jameson gets really upset because Quentin's going to marry Angelique yeah. and, not, and not Beth. And... You know, I figured, well, Jameson's mother has been gone, you know, for several years with her brief, you know, reappearance where she tried to burn him alive. And, but, and so Beth has been around for, you know, at least, what, three, four years yeah. at the house? She was a fixture there before Quentin left. Yeah. And that, you know, Jameson obviously very attached to Beth, substitute mother figure, just like Quentin's a substitute father figure. And um, and so, what is the name that Jameson Collins gives to his first child? Beth, I believe. Elizabeth. Oh, Elizabeth, that's right. Yep, Elizabeth. Elizabeth Collins Stoddard. Elizabeth, yep. Yeah. And so, she was named Elizabeth Collins Stoddard. How did he know that her last... She was going to marry a guy named Stoddard. But seriously, he, he, names, he names her after... His essentially his mom. Yeah. He's that into her, and that is just a wonderful piece of accidental but beautiful consistency on the show. Yeah. So that's how I'm doing. Yeah, I just figured that out. I think Beth has literally the weight of the world on her shoulders. She has to take care of Jenny. Oh, she has to take care of Jenny. She's basically cleaning up Quentin's mess that he left. I mean... Then she becomes sort of a stooge for, for Barnabas, then yep. a stooge for Potofi. Yep. Uh, she, and and then what happens? Does she just sort of stay at Collinwood or does she go away? Do you remember? It's She she jumps off Widow's Hill. Oh, you're right. Because... <laughs> another one jumps off Widow... Yeah, another Barnabas-Quentin parallel... She jumps off. What was I think? She does sort of stay at Collinwood. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, you know, staying in the rocks. You know, pro, pro, providing a, providing a target for for Bill Malloy years later. Um, yeah. 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 Wow. She thought that Quentin, that Potofi was still in Quentin's body. That's right. So when Quentin's coming here, get away from me! Get away from me! No, he's trying to tell her, and she ain't listening. She just whoop over. Stay away from Widow's Hill. I mean, the game did something ominous. What more do they have to do, you know, than what they call it Stinky Cheese Hill or something? What what can they do to get people to stay away? It, call it, it TV Hill. Then people will stay away in droves. It's like the water in Jaws. When people put don't swim, they're, they're just going up on that hill. It's an ad. <laughs> it's, that's, what, that's what humans do. It if is. if they called it Learning Experience Hill, no one would get near it. No, no, they <laughs> they would. <laughs> I gotta show you something, man. Okay. Oh, that Barnabas Collins mug. Yep. I love it. Where'd you get that? Amazon, actually. Really yes. cool. That's a nice. That's a that's a spiffy mug. Thank you. I've been looking at. I'm gonna for my birthday. I'm gonna get a Quentin Collins mug. 
Because I told oh. my, she, my wife's like, what do you want? I was like, Quentin Collins mug is next. He's like, she's like, all right. <laughs> but, but, now, I don't know. Are you a drinking man? Uh, I don't drink liquor or alcohol, now. Okay, good for you. Good for you. <laughs> well, I, I will, and I'll tell you about it. Uh, you, should find, you should find some poor lost sap who's going to hell and have him drink the Quentin Collins cocktail that I invented for Wallace's site and have him drink it out of the Quentin Collins mug. Did, did, did you read that cocktail recipe? Do you know what's in it? I read the Willie Loomis cocktail. The, the, the Wake Up Willie's Wake up, Yeah. That... The Quentin Collins cocktail has bacon in it. <laughs> it's got bacon-infused bourbon. I bought it. You yourself. I bought bacon today. <laughs> Okay, so, I bought bourbon today. So, you know, I'll figure something out. <laughs> I love you, Patrick. That is funny. But, for, sorry. Bet, with Beth going over hill, right? Quentin, Quentin's, and again, he's lost someone else. He's lost the son. Now he's lost Beth. Yeah. I, I mean, so, is, is Quentin's life more crazier than Barnabas's, you think? It's 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 more concentrated. I mean, you know, Barnabas loses a brother, he loses a fiance, he loses his mom, yeah. he loses Sarah. Yeah. I think probably in the loss department. You know, because yeah, Quentin loses a brother, but it's Carl, so that's actually a plus. <laughs> you know, I so so we can't count we have to sort of count that for so Quentin loses a wife yep. and he loses his son. Yeah. But he never knew his son, so yeah. I, I mean, you know, it bothers him. But yeah. he never, uh, yeah, not as much as if, or maybe more. Yeah. Oh, he never knew he had kids, and that's that's a part of it too. Once, yeah. Once he in this country. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, right. And, and the thing, my God, oh my God, Quentin must have werewolf progeny. All over the what I get, don't go to Egypt, <laughs> don't go to Egypt. And you know, you know who's Egyptian, Boris Karloff. Yeah, yeah. so but seriously, Quentin, really come on, you're telling me Quentin just has one son or two, two kids, the one woman, right? Yeah, right. Uh, yeah, his, his daughter, in fact, was not his, was not his son, but yeah, he, uh, although you know, anything's possible. Uh, I'm a, if she wants to be a son, she can be. That's what I say. Yes, we can. Listen, Quentin Collins got got around more than James Bond ever dreamed about. I'd like to think so. <laughs> I'd like to think so. I, I'm gonna there say... are things I could say about the mutton chops, but this is a family show. <laughs> <laughs> we'll try to keep it somewhat family, right? But um, <laughs> who is your favorite ghost? Uh, Sherman Hemsley, ghost dad. Oh, no, no, that was. Oh no, no, God, no, God, no, that's not. No, 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 nothing, nothing with, uh, nothing with Bill, even with those sweaters. Um, uh, but Sherman Hemsley was in something about ghosts. He was in a. He was in some kind of, like Ghostbusters type ripoff. Really? Do you remember that? No, I do not. He I want. He was. But are you talking about Ghosts on Dark Shadows? Yeah, I'm talking about um, who's your favorite Ghost on Dark Shadows. Sorry for not clarifying. No, that's okay. I mean, I have a lot of a lot of ghosts in my past. Um, uh, God, my favorite Ghost. Um, what are the what are the cra- Yeah, he was in he was in a TV show. I'm sorry, he was in a TV show, I think, or a movie called Ghost Fever. Oh wow! That that starred, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It starred Luis Alvarez, G- Jennifer Rhodes, uh, nineteen eighty-seven, directed by Lee Madden. Yeah, I knew there was some sort of ghost thing. Anyway, who cares? My favorite ghost, um, I, you know, I guess I guess Quentin, no. like the scariest ghost or the friendliest ghost or Terchev and Salon ghosts. It. What I was more or less asking was, which who, who was your favorite ghost on Dark Shadows? And yeah, well, even even that has right such variety, um, because they all they all count. Yep. 
Uh, it's you know Damon Edwards best dressed. Damian Edwards, remember him? He's the ghost in parallel time that steals B. Arthur's pantsuit. And uh, uh, and you know Quentin is Quentin is probably the scariest because he's the most intentionally malevolent. Mm. Uh, but then Gerard is the most effectively destructive. Yeah. Um, then you've got Ghost of Josette. I, I would say Ghost of Josette maybe because in, I think it's episode 100? That, uh, that 100 or 150, it's 150, where, uh, where they kill... They killed Matthew Morgan. Matthew Morgan yeah. Remember, and all those ghosts come out of the woodwork. That, to me, is the scariest, dare I say, the most realistic uh, depiction of ghosts uh, on the show because they seem both malevolent and neutral. So who's your favorite ghost? I'm going to cheat. I have two. Okay. <laughs> I love the ghost uh, when Josette first comes out of the portrait. I love that. It's great. And I think the fact that it's kind of fuzzy, kinescope, black and yep. white, yep. makes it more effective. Yes. Yes. One thousand. Agree. Agree. One thousand yep. percent. And my favorite ghost of all time is Sarah. I just love the way they introduced her. Her to like tossing the ball, sending London, London Bridge. Here's Kathleen Lee Scott putting her over too, like selling it. You know, amazing chemistry. You know, the thing that I really like about that, I think you're right, and the thing I really like about that is that Sarah's ghost is um, she, normally the type of character that Sarah's ghost is is someone we would just hear someone else talk about. Right. Uh, but we actually get to see the ghost interaction uh, from the point of view of the people who are having it, other people who are hearing about it, and I love the way they handle her just uh, happening and not happening, and this strange combination of realism and and not realism. Because I've ne I've never seen a ghost, I'm I'm relatively skeptical, and I've noticed something about people who have, and it's this: if if you meet people who have seen ghosts. They are very nonchalant about it. They're like, yeah, I saw a ghost. It happened. Yeah, you know, oh, yeah, this old woman used to show up and talk to me through my bedroom window or whatever. And um, and my theory is, is that if ghosts exist, there is some slight difference in the construction of the brain of the people who can see them that not only allows them to see them but keeps them from freaking out. Because I would have to change my pants if I saw a ghost. I mean, it's like the inexplicable, here's this thing that shouldn't be there, now it's gone. Thought, just the thought of that, the the universe-defying cause and effect-defying existence of that scares the bejesus out of me. So, uh, and, and Sarah allows us to see that kind of ghost, but from the nonchalant point of view right. of the person who's built to be able to see ghosts. Yeah. I love, I just love how when Catherine Lee Scott's little girl, little girl. And it's like, Oh my God. Like the cell job Catherine Lee Scott does. I mean, I love when she's the prisoner of Barnabas and she's just hollering for Sarah, like little girl. It's just amazing. You know, that's, that's one of the things about Catherine Scott that is so terrific is that you know when when I when I think of her on the show I think of a very poised very controlled very disciplined presence uh, and yet when she is Barnabas's prisoner she is able to unload with such ferocity yep. that all of the that poised quality, all of that composed quality, that disciplined quality adds to because we see, oh my God, this is this is someone that together who is losing it that much. 
same as in one of my favorite episodes, which is the Parallel Time episode where Quentin leaves, or where she leaves Quentin. Yep. And they have an argument that is, to me, best acted moment on the entire show. And, and again, it's suddenly, it's absolutely ferocious, but it's not loud voices. You know, it's right. not just an actor, you know, getting louder and, and substituting that for, for acting. No, this is this is authentic emotional transportation. Right. Uh, it, that's it. By the way, that is in Patrick's book, the Dark Shadows Day book, where him and they're not necessarily screaming at each other, screaming at the top of their lungs, but it's an argument, and you know it. And she just oh yeah, she walks. They, they get loud enough. Yep. They get loud enough. Yep. And the 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 cues are so tight. And it just, it ceases feeling like acting. Yeah. It just, it becomes something else. She, she walks out, you're right, it's powerful and it's great. And what I love most about the, when she's with Barnabas, when she's captured by him, I love when she's in Josette's room and he's wanting her to be Josette and she goes, I'm Maggie. And she, she slams the lid, the lid down on the music. I'm like, you go girl, you go. That's a moment so good. It right. makes me want them to not remake that part of the show. Right. Yep. Leave that one alone. That's like remaking, you know, uh, Rick and Ilsa. Just, yep. just, just don't do it. Leave it. Leave it be. That whole. I don't know how. Look, Fred, Fred, and Catherine Lee Scott. I mean, they just were amazing. I mean, she just boom and then he's like mad at her like but he's not getting necessarily violent with her he's just like okay i'll lock you in the basement <laughs> and it's like and there's a gun back here's your punishment <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> it's like we know that he has josette's dress right where did he have that lying around <laughs> is it that he said willie make the most attractive dress you can knowing that it would be a disaster ahead of time and then giving that to her as a punishment. I don't know. <laughs> Barnab the good ones. Yes, I know, Willie. <laughs> I, I think Barnabas had secretly had every jo dress Josette ever wore. I really do. <laughs> Somewhere in that house. <laughs> I don't know what they made things of in the 1790s, but, you know, it put, puts polyester to shame. It's that stuff. It does, it does. I think the one thing I love the most, too, with, with that whole him capturing her and her finally getting away is you feel it. You feel all of it as she's get, she's escaping. You're going, go, go, go. You're rooting for her, you know? And it's just so well shot. I love the escape. How do you... Do you, do you feel sorry for Barnabas? Do, yeah. I, do I feel sorry for him? I'm going to put it this way. I know some people go, well, do you forgive... Because I've been asked the opposite. Do you forgive him for kidnapping Maggie? Yeah. And I go, I've never I've never felt ill will against him for kidnapping Maggie. To him, Maggie's Josette. To him. It's a deep programming. Right. It's like a cult deep programmer. Yeah. I think he really... My thinking is, Barnabas is sort of convinced this is the Matrix. Yeah. This is some weird illusion created by Angelique where, oh, good, now I'm, now my father is called Roger. Yep. You know, now Aunt Abigail is the maid who answers the door. Yep. You know, what sort of perverse kind of inversion is this? And in some ways, to your point, too, he could sort of look at this as a parallel time that Angelique could have created. In, sure. In some weird way. That where everybody just has a different name and a different dress and a different coat, you know, and Victoria is just some person maybe Angelique fabricated. Who knows, you know, to him, he's he's been in a coffin for 200 years. He, he saw firsthand what Angelique was capable of. Do you remember whether or not the show really goes into how conscious of the passage of time Barnabas is in the coffin. Is he in suspended animation? 
or is he aware? I think the audio dramas might have. I'm not. Nah, don't count. I love you, Joe uh, Lister, but those don't count. I mean, we've got to go with the prime. Okay. The prime. The prime. To me, no. No, they didn't. Nope. No. Not, he's not a passage of time. I don't think he's. I'll put it to you this way. I think because Joshua put the cross over. I think yeah. it was supposed to have him not be aware of the time he's in or awake. Okay. I think that's where I'll go with that. I've always wondered about it. I, so for some reason, I always felt like the show played fast and loose. But, you know, the show in that period is so slow, and I don't say this as a criticism. Right. It's so slow, and it reveals so little that it really gives you plenty of time for your imagination to fill in a lot of blanks. Yep. I think you know when Barnabas is laying in that coffin and he finally comes out and he sees, you know, Willie Loomis. To yeah. Him, to him, and I could see your point too. Again, to him, how how do I know this is in a creation of Angelique? To him, everything to him is questionable. Mm-hmm. In the open world of Collinsport and Collinwood, all is questionable. So he has. So when does that change? When when do you think Barnabas gains certainty? When he to me, right, sometime right before seventeen ninety five. Wow, that far. Yeah. Some I. And here's why I said it. When he meets Hoffman, I think it's sometime after that. Okay. But, but I would. I got an. I got a. I got a play as arbitrary. Right. It's completely arbitrary. Right. But I think it's when he thinks Maggie's dead. Okay. That's when she does a big escape attempt, and it is too horrible. For him to believe even Angelique would be this cruel, right? And uh, and it's like, oh, oh, I screwed up. I did a naughty, right. right? And that's when he becomes even more obsessed with Sarah's forgiveness, yep. and so on, because there's so much more to forgive. And even with, I think what helps that too, to your point, is Julia tells him, "I saw Sarah." You know, that too. Which... That's got to be the worst. <laughs> and, and it's like, and then Julia's there when Sarah shows up and, and gives Barnabas the business. Like, oh, get Sarah, not in front of Dr. Hoffman. Do you know how long am I? I'm going to hear about this for weeks. Yeah. yeah. Well, yes, I know who has the remote for the next six weeks. <laughs> hey, Sarah. <laughs> It's like you had to die, and then you had to go do this. <laughs> by the way, Sarah, by the way, do you know I was kind of mad about your death, and guess what happened to me as a result? Yes. I got turned into this. Yes. So don't say that I don't care. Yeah. And don't, no nursery rhyme, Sarah, I've had a rough time, and it's because I love you. Yep. Yeah. He really... I mean, he loved her. He He's the one. I mean, he loved his mom and dad. But to him, Sarah was that one person he really loved and cared for. Outside I, of... Yeah. Okay. I would say that there are... But, you know, it's funny. Quentin is a character who intensely loves a very few people. Yeah. For the most part, ones whose names rhyme with Quentin Collins. But... Barnabas actually loves a lot, yep. and he gets punished for it. Because when you think about, okay, well, who is the, who is the true love of Barnabas? Okay, so let's count them on. And they're all authentic. That's great. We got Angelique. Yep. We've got Josette. Yep. We've got his his mother certainly. I think he likes his father. He respects him. But, you know, uh, uh, Jeremiah. Yep. Um. Sarah, and then Ben Stokes. I don't think 
you can discount ben. ben stokes and more in the other direction i don't think you can discount that ben St- that that in that, that in a completely authentic way um that Barnabas is the love of Ben Stokes' life. And, you know, sometimes the love of your life is romantic. Yep. Sometimes the love of your life is erotic. Yep. And sometimes the love of your life is neither. Right. And um, and that that is, I mean, when you see everything Ben Stokes goes through and does, especially after Barnabas becomes a vampire, yep. And that inversion of, you know, who is the, you know, now who's the master and who's the apprentice? Who's the wise one and who's not? Um, yeah. I think Ben Ben and Barnabas, though they are not biological family, they were like family to one another. They were like brothers. Sure. And of course, Barnabas could never acknowledge it even to himself because yep. of the class system, yep. which... And and Ben knows it, and Ben doesn't care, and that's what makes his his love for him that much more authentic. Yeah, I agree. I th- I think Fair David, what an actor! I mean, he just what I love him as Professor Stokes, but Ben Stokes really wins you over prior to seeing Professor Stokes. Well, sure, and I think. You know, they, you, you, Thayer David has bought a lot of uh, leeway, and Professor Stokes has bought a lot of leeway because we know his roots and we know his stock. Right. You know, we know what he's made of and we know how reliable he is. And so, it, A, it's just satisfying to see that the Stokes has made this good. You know, the Stokes has done good. And and so he can get away with this incredibly arrogant shtick, and we love him all the more because we just don't have any doubt that he's a good guy. Yep. I love the fact that when him and Barnabas are talking, he the the closes when he says goodbye to Barnabas, he's saying goodbye not just as a friend, not a, not just as a brother, but everything in between, all of it. You know, he's just, he's sad. He didn't want him to end up this way, in a sense. That, oh, wait, who's the he? Ben didn't want, he knew Barnabas had to get chained, in a sense. But in a lot of ways, I don't feel Ben wanted that for Barnabas in some way. So here's a big question. I don't think Ben is ever asked by Barnabas to stake him. Right. I don't so, think either. Would Ben have done so? Because he's killed once. Yep. If if Barnabas asked him to, and he's the reason Barnabas doesn't ask him to, because he knows he'll actually do it. Uh, I think Ben would do it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Because because I think Ben's a you know Ben's a I don't know if he was a soldier or not, but he's a he's a rough mean sob when he needs to be. And I think he knows that he loves Barnabas enough, and he respects the class system enough. He asked me to kill him. Yep. That's my job. Yep. Uh, I don't want to do it, but and then behind the behind you know closed doors, I would say, you know, I'm glad he had the guts to ask me to do it because it's saved a lot of lives. Yeah. I hated doing it, but I love him because he asked me to. Yeah. I think he would have went to do it, but Angelique would have stopped him from doing it. Oh, definitely. Right. Definitely. She would. It, I was telling a friend of mine this, Darnell Weeks. He goes, what if somebody tried to kill Barnabas? I said, Angelique would never let it happen. <laughs> as long as she were aware of it. Yes. You know, it depends on kind of the form Angelique has taken. Yeah. Because... Sometimes she's more corporeal than others. Yeah. And when she is really in corporeal human form, no, she can't be everywhere at once because Barnabas's life gets threatened too many times. 
Yes, it does. However, when she, you know, when she's, when she's downstairs, so to speak, and you know, she's she's working for Diabolos, and she's just kind of this cosmic essence of evil, um, aka his wife. Yeah. Uh, uh, then, you know, sure, she's she's absolutely aware of it because if anyone's going to kill Barnabas, ultimately, she wants it to be her. She's either going to love him or marry him, but one way or the other, it's going to be to death. Yeah. Speaking of Diablos, so sure. if they cast a devil in the new Dark yeah. Shadow series, who would you want to see play the devil? Well, I mean, they did. It was Dwayne Morris. It was the guy who played Diablos, Diablos. I think. Yeah. So uh, I can't get away from that. I mean, if they cast... Another deal, like Diablo's dad or something like that. Yeah. Um, in that time period, right? Like in our time period now? Or? No, I mean back in back in the nineteen sixties. Yeah, back in the nineteen sixties. Yeah. Um, Herbert Lom. No. Yeah, I cast Herbert Lom. I would cast Rod Serling. Oh, that's a good choice. I would like for the '60s, because no one screamed Satan more than <laughs> for me. He said he said he said it with the his lip curled up. And yeah. The cigarette. Yeah. Um, oh my god. That's 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 what an interesting question. Right. Uh, wow. Um, but now, what sort of devil would would Rod Serling have made though? I mean, would he have been? Would he have been winking at the audience too much, or...? For me, the devil is charming and sinister all at the same time. So sure. to me, that's what Rod Serling would have been, in my vision, what I see. That any anybody playing the devil today, like if someone played the devil on Dark Shadows today, charming and sinister. The, it, the My introduction for the devil would be him him sitting at the old house and somebody pouring Barnabas a cup of blood and instead of Barnabas getting that blood the devil takes the cup and drinks it oh I'm sorry was that for you? so you're really thinking of sort of Roddy McDowell Fantasy Island right type, right type right, devil. right yeah right. okay <laughs> sorry well because you know then you can really ask okay well who do you if, if it's going to be a more chilling presence if you're going to go more literal with it well then that opens up that's right. an entirely other interpretation that's what i that's that's where i was going with herbert long uh um yeah yeah i god i klaus kinski but i but you know because this this brings up the nature of of not only entertainment of that era and interpretations of the devil, right. but um, but the nature of, of evil. Right. And is that a thing that, you know, Dark Shadows wants to truly contemplate? Right. Because this is a universe that gives us Nicholas Blair. Yes. You know, and um and so do we do we want to go further in that kind of natty or bane kind of episode of Frasier like direction yeah. or or is this really the author of the immense amount of pain mm -hmm. in the series what do you think I think for me just speaking for me I wouldn't mind seeing somebody portray the actual devil the devil take a human form so to speak and when I was when I was writing a dark my dark shadow story I had visualized Justin Bean as Satan, and <laughs> because he's he's a talk he's a media talk show. Well, he's he has his own radio show, the Justin Bean Radio Hour, and he uh -huh. he works for he's a producer at Shout Factory, so he does a lot of interviews. Oh, okay. So, but his voice is so nice and kind, and I'm thinking every time I heard his voice, I kept for whatever reason picturing him as the devil. I don't know why, but... <laughs> you know, who would make an interesting devil on that show? Who's that? It would have been Mr. Wells. 
Yes. I mean, he's killed by a werewolf, so, yep. yeah. But, uh, but, you know, who knows? That could just be an illusion. It's just this guy. Yep. It's this guy that, of course, no, he's, he's Prince of Lies. Yep. So he's not going to call attention to himself. That's the first mm-hmm. lie. Yep. Of course you didn't expect me. You know, um, it's, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, uh, oh, Tony Peterson. Yeah. It's just, it's just, a, it's just a guy. Um, yeah, I just imagine a semi-homeless drifter at the Blue Whale yeah. who has just enough money for beer for the day. Right. And he's just in a corner that we don't see that's where the camera is. He's yeah. in that, of course he's where the camera is, and he's just watching. Yeah. Just watching it all unfold. I, I I love that. That's such a great visual of somebody just sitting back and like watching. Oh, and I love that. <laughs> That's so cool. It, it's it's you know who you would cast as it now is Jackie Earl Haley. Yes. And you'd never give him lines, and he would just be in a ratty black sweater. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Maybe he was on a ship for a while. Maybe he was a longshoreman or something. Nobody, nobody really even. Was he there? Was that? Was there a guy? Oh, yeah, it's that guy. Yeah. And they turn around, they just don't even remember him being there. Right. Because the greatest the greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Uh, yeah, according to a lot of literature, sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. In fact, what did that come from? There's some movie or something where, you know, the greatest, greatest trick he performs is convincing people he didn't exist. What's that from? Oh, uh, that is from The Usual Suspects. Oh yeah, 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 Kaiser Sosa. Yes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, Gabriel Byrne, Kevin Spacey, and uh, great cast. But <laughs> so, what? Sorry, what is your favorite effect in the show? Special effect that they pulled off. Um. Uh. Honestly. Well, I do that. Josette coming out of the painting. Nice. And because it's just, it's like, if you ask me, what does a ghost coming out of a painting look like? I would probably describe something like that. Right. Um, or the fact that they did not use effects with Sarah appearing or disappearing. Right. And thus, it's totally real because you're not shown anything to disbelieve. My effect's going to sound corny. But when the Leviathan, okay, I have one more after okay. after that. The Levi, when the Leviathan did the breathing, I love that. It's creepy. Sure. It's edgy. If it was Halloween before Halloween, it was Michael Myers before Michael Myers. It was. It just made you. It made my like not my skin crawl, but I had goosebumps every time I lay here. It. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are leaving out the one effect, and I really uh, no no joke. We f- we've forgotten it because it is the best, most artful special effect on the show, and that's Dick Smith's age makeup. Yeah, yeah. Greatest effects makeup artist of all time, and and his first great, truly great age makeup. Yeah. I love when old man Barnabas. Uh-huh. <laughs> I actually had a picture where Barnabas was old and he's standing behind Julie and I put the question Julie do you accept AARP <laughs> true <laughs> right. um, okay so this this has been a point of contention uh, old Barnabas with hair or without hair movie old Barnabas or TV old Barnabas I'm gonna cheat I love them both I do I can't decide Patrick I'm sorry there is something about the hairless old Barnabas that, for me, is almost too grotesque. Right. There's something about seeing the white hair pulled into those points yeah. that just makes us go, oh, oh, yeah. Barnabas, oh, okay. Yeah. And there's a naughty thing about this that I'm only going to allude to. So where does Barnabas first see the effects of his age in the movie or in the show i think in the tv show maybe and in the movie like 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 what does he notice first 
I know he notices his hands. Exactly. So it goes from the outside in. Mm. And so just, you know, I'm just going to say, what else? <laughs> you know? Oh, oh boy, that's Julia! <laughs> <laughs> No, I get, no, I get what you're saying, right. I, the fact that he's old, the fact that he knows he can see that he's old, he does not want to see the rest of his body, and he can only imagine what that looks like, right? Oh, that's not what I was trying to say. Is that what you were thinking? I was like, oh, Lord, where did your mind go? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. My mind is gone, man. My mind is gone. <laughs> That's where my mind's at. There's an app. There's an app that allows you to do puppet shows. Really? With like 2D puppets, you know, and you can yeah. do this animation. And then if you talk, the mouths will move. Yeah. You know, like it recognizes it. And like you could do like walrus sheriffs or whatever. So the first thing I did, and, and it, it like repitches the voices yeah. also, is I took uh, Sam Loomis's monologue about that blank pale face and i put it over these weird puppets it was very funny anyway continue <laughs> that's awesome i love that that's that cool. awesome. that's so cool but what when you think of the beginning of dark shadows from the end do you think that they'll be with the with a new series they'll be able to pick up with the snap of their fingers instantly no, I can I be honest? I sure. um, yeah. I'm I I have a lot of I have a lot of trepidation. Sure. Um, I I really think it's been it's been a lot of time. Right. I think you're dealing with a very probably small, unfortunately, the ever dwindling population of of people who really 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 remember all of those characters especially as primary characters right you know as the characters they remember you know being contemporary with with themselves um and most of all the visual style and world of the tv series and the visual style and language and world of television now are just so different I can't imagine reconciling the two in my mind. I mean, you you might have to go, I said don't go too stylized, but you might have to go out of your way to make the, the quality of the, the film processing and everything else and the colors and the yeah. sets look like late 60s video. Right. I, I, just, I just don't know how else it would feel like Dark Shadows. Right. And, and, you know, pretty much you're, you got Maggie and you got Quentin, thank God, and you've got Angelique. Yep. And, and other than that triumvirate, we are going to be asked to accept a whole new cast of characters. And I'm not saying it can't be done, right. but it better be Data and Riker and Worf level characters. Right. Um, I I don't know. I'm I'm scared to, to death. I, I right. really am. I don't think it's a it's a bad idea. Right. But it's one of the most ambitious ideas I think ever attempted. I, I'm I know you're excited for it, like, but in uh, yeah, I'm on right. Out. I don't want right. I don't want people who are listening to us think Patrick isn't excited. He's excited for it too. As I'm a, just, I'm just, I, I accept the challenge level. Right. Is high. Yes, very. I think the expectation, like we've both seen the original series, and when you look at the revival, when you look at the O four on the pilot, it doesn't hold a candle to the original. And doesn't. And the the one advantage that those have is that. They essentially are parallel times. Yeah. yeah. They are not trying it. The, 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 the place where I get nervous is uh, that I think of House of Dark Shadows. Right. And do you ever watch House of Dark Shadows? And it just, it kind of 
feels so little off because the visual world is off because Colin Wood doesn't look like Colin Wood because the film stock doesn't look like the, mm. sort of the visual language of the show. It doesn't make it bad, but it's very, very different. I think the film language, when I look at the Dark Shadows movies, all three of them, okay, House, Night, I don't, I've never, in, for me, I've never compared them to the series. They're different. Yeah. They're, they're, they're night, the, sheer, the series is day, or whatever you want to swap. And that's yeah. how I view it. Okay, that's fair. And, you know, okay, so now I'm going to come up with a counterexample. Okay. And it's that uh, I should apply the same rule to Star Trek. Okay. And yet, when we go from Star Trek the series to Star Trek the motion picture, right. the feel is, oh, so this is what it really looked like. <laughs> and if and if they do it right, that's what the new Dark Shadow series will feel like. Right. It's like, oh, this is what it really looked like. It's kind of like Alex Ross comic book art. Right. You know, it's like, oh, that's what these characters really look like. So I think they could pull that off. Did you see where the Seaview Terrace is up for sale? Sure. Thirty million dollars. I made a suggestion that I feel I, that I think Mark B. Perry should buy the mansion and just film the series. <laughs> well, you know that would be a, a really incredible statement. I mean, I I don't know how much a network is going to invest. Right. But let's let's think about it. I mean, you know, Star Trek the Motion Picture or Star Trek the Last Generation in 1987 cost about a million dollars an episode. Wow. So that's well, the and the Flash, just a few years later, definitely cost over a million dollars yeah. an episode. So now you have shows that cost much more. Yeah. You know, I mean, my God, what did Friends cost to produce towards the end? Those actors were pulling in obscene amounts of money. So if there is that kind of money to throw around, yep. you will have an automatic just fascination factor with that first season if you do buy Seaview Terrace, if you do say, okay, this is where we're going to do it, yep. and put that kind of investment into it and, um, and go, you know, uh, scale for all the rest, you know, pay everybody else scale. Um, I well, I, I think that would be magical. It would be. Can I give you my trailer pitch for the new Dark? Hey. You, you would see darkness at first, but you would hear seagulls and the waves. Uh huh. And what we would be, we would be a bird or a seagull ourselves, and we would be looking out at the ocean. We'd be sitting on a post, uh -huh. and we'd hear some. This, like distinct voices going we got to get it up before nightfall and you would hear like this electric sound like what is that and then the bird would look basically us and what would come on would be the blue whale song the sign the blue whale and it would call it would scare the bird off us off the bird and it would fly over the the waves hitting widows the rocks beneath widows hill over the cliff and over the house and that would and it would say dark shadows i like it thank you <laughs> i like it i like it a lot yeah yeah i um you know i saw a cb i know, you know lots of people have this experience i guess but for me it happened i didn't intend it to happen right uh, when i saw cb terrace yeah. and uh it was uh i was on a tour of that area i was chaperoning oh. And we were going to the Breakers, which was a Vanderbilt mansion. And we were on a tour bus. And um, and the tour bus stopped for some reason. Yeah. And I looked out the window. And do you remember the trailer for Star Trek 09 where Kirk is on the motorcycle and he stops in the middle of Iowa? Yes. And he's, he's the Enterprise being constructed? Yes. It was, it was that moment. I mean, I didn't. Wow. I I knew it was a real house or something, but I didn't right. know where or how. Right. And I turned around, 
And it was one of the most magical moments in my life. It took my breath away. It was fantastic. And it's it's even more impressive than you can imagine. Right. Was it, it for you, was it just like, oh, my God, there it is? My, I, it is going to sound like the most fanboy no. thing. Uh, everything stopped. No, my I believe it. Stopped. My breath stopped. I believe it. Um, because it was so unexpected. If I had known I was going on a tour of it or whatever, that's fine. But especially because I wasn't thinking of it. I hadn't seen an episode of Dark Shadows for a few years. And, uh, because this was long before the DVDs came out, or at least a few years before the DVDs came out. And it was just breathtaking. Right. Yeah. That's aw- that's an awesome story, man. I love that. That is it so cool. Beautiful. I mean, it was it was it was I, it was so overwhelming. I couldn't even have tears. Right. I just stopped. Right. For you, okay. Who? What is your favorite uh, song from Dark Shadows? Uh, I you got to be more specific, like Blue Whale type song, or a song that I put in a movie. <laughs> I'm, or, so, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. Um, what's your favorite? Basically, what's your favorite track from the original series? Favorite song from the original series? Favorite music from the original series? Yes. Uh, oh boy. Um. Uh, I. <laughs> I, the the opening theme, uh, Quentin's theme. Right. Um, uh, I wrote lyrics, of course, to Joanna. Cool. Yeah. Do you want me to sing? Do you want me to sing it? It's if you, amazing. You can go ahead, man. I'm wearing pants. They're made of lycra, and they cling to me in oh so many ways. They're just pants, you see, but pants for me to wear for all my days. When I think of all the leather later hosen that people wear in far off Germany, they say they chafe, and I guess they are supposing that we will see that they are firm of knee. And then it just repeats. Um, it has nothing to do with the show. Right. But um, I was very bored when I got an oil change once. <laughs> Thank you. I hey, love that. What's your favorite piece of music? Because you don't ask that without having one. I love Quentin's theme. That's my favorite theme. But overall, I, I mean, I enjoy the whole thing. I can't sit here and say that it's... For me, Robert Robert Cobert is a composer who doesn't get enough credit. Oh, yeah. You know, I think it was studying Robert Cobert's music, right. or Cobert, I think, that got uh, Jim Pearson into Dark Shadows. Cool. That's... I think he was a, uh, I think he was a, um, uh, like a, like a music scholar, a music guy. And that kind, I, that's the story I heard. That is, that is awesome. That is so cool. Is, is, do you guys have a, a date set for the day book part two? Um, oh, okay. (laughs) Yes and no. Okay. Uh, I have a date that I proposed. Okay. And the date I proposed was October 5th. Right. Because that would coincide with the Jonathan Frid documentary. Right. Um, I, I, I would be really thrilled if that happened. Yes. But, you know, the people who have looked at the day book have all talked about the art. And I, uh, I remember your comment about the Quentin piece, which is astounding. You know, you, you talked about that in your video. And I don't think people really have an, uh, an idea of how hard Wallace worked and how he had to retypeset things a number of times and just how uh, laborious that process was to insert all of that and do all of that. There was a version that had a lot more art and he was worried was detracting from it 
and so he pulled back. So, uh, but also, you know, now that it's kind of down to a science, he, you know, uh, it, mm. it might happen very quickly. I'm not saying it's all continuing on Wallace, mm. right. and I think that it's a hell of a lot of work. Yeah. I'm going to show you something. This is the art Patrick's talking about that Wallace, you know. Do you see? Yeah, I can see. Okay. I'm just um, He, I love, like, the whole thing, like, the artwork, like, the little girl. Did you? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're right. He, you guys, the, the, you guys' work, like, the writing, the artwork, it complements the book together, like, both of it. And that's, it really does. It really, it re sorry, go ahead. No, that's, that's all. It, um. I, I was gonna. I was gonna ask you a question, and I guess it's a little. It's it's a little self-serving, but it's of course it's coming from me. Um, you you talk about that. You know your favorite piece of artwork in it, and I mean, you know, wow, you you read this, and it took it, must, it was nineteen episodes, so that must be, you know, eighteen or so hours, seventeen, eighteen hours, because each one is close to an hour. Yeah. Or so, right? Yep. Um, sometimes over. Yep. Uh. So what was that like? And you talk about your favorite artwork. What was your what what piece did you like the most? Uh, exclude. I know you talked about the Carlin my, my, piece. So excluding that. Okay, excluding the John Carlin Memorial, which I love. Yeah. My favorite was when you talked about Parallel Time, because really? Parallel Time does some people like it, some people don't. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody loves 1795 and 1897. Sure. But Parallel yeah. and and that and the leviathan because those are the two most controversial and yes i like the leviathan arc and i like parallel time i think it's very interesting you know dark shadows dealt in all sorts of things and the fact that they went into parallel time it was like you're like what are they going to do next and then it here's parallel time it's like holy crap like that. So what were the things in parallel time or in in the discussion of in the book that that got your attention the most? Because I I'm I'm very happy with that, but it surprises me, and so I'm just I'm curious to hear you know you, what, how, how what 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 did that? You mentioned you mentioned this in our discussion here, and it was it's in the book where Maggie and Quentin are having that argument because, yeah. and I'm not trying to make this like personal or anything, but my dad was an asshole. Okay. My mom, I wish she would have left my dad. Yeah. She, she was abused by him, and so were me and my brother. So okay. when I read that, I sort of was crying, like I was, I wanted to cry, but I was reading, <laughs> I was recording, and yeah. couldn't. And I, when I when I stopped recording, my wife come out. And she goes, "Why are you crying?" I said, "I wish my mom would have had the nerve to do what Maggie did." I said, "Cause it." It touched me because, you know, I didn't really, you know what I mean? It just, that really struck at my heart. Well, like, not in, a bad, not in a bad way, just. No, 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 because that's one of my favorite pieces in it. Yeah. And I talk about domestic abuse two different places pretty strongly. I also talk about it when I talk about the last episode yeah. and Morgan. Yeah. And, um, I, uh, you know, this is without, without, you know, getting, again, without getting too personal, um, you know, if you had an actual diary of sort of my life and so on, and then you looked at the daybook pieces I was writing, uh, basically I am, I, I was using the daybook to talk about things that were on my mind and I, and I still do when I write it, but right. Uh, there, are, I mean, there are reasons that it slowed down a little bit. I talked about some time, but um, uh, that's as much as as what the day book, you know, is about. And um, I have had the uh, the the misfortune uh, and the and kind of the honor to be the the friend and counsel and and frustrated friend of uh, a number of victims of domestic abuse. Right. And uh, and especially lately, especially in the period that I was writing that. Right. And it's uh, wildly, of course, it's nothing sadder. Right. 
And it's also wildly frustrating. It's just infuriatingly frustrating because the insidious thing about domestic abuse is that it is so self-perpetuating that that once you, you know, normally you do something mean to someone and they go away. But the, the truly insidious thing about domestic abuse is that somehow these abusers have wormed their way into the minds of perfectly good people and convinced them to say, thank you, sir, may I have another? I'm directing Little Shop of Horrors right now. I'm having a really tough time just emotionally dealing with the Audrey Orton stuff. You know, he's the dentist because he is so abusive. And And I'm talking a lot with the actor I have playing Seymour about, you know, how does a good person react? to a domestic abuser when they're in that position of powerlessness. So uh, when I saw that, and when I saw that moment, I really thought, I thought, good God, Quentin is the monster of the storyline. You know, you give John Yeager a formula and he stops turning into, or he stops being, you know, stops stops being a bad guy. And, and, you know, you perform an exorcism and there goes Cyrus, you know, there goes Damien Edwards, and you know, you burn down the joint and there goes Angelique. And so all of these other things have solutions. But the fact is, is that there are just millions of, of Clintons out there. Yeah, and, yeah there are. And back then, yeah. even more, because it was so sanctioned. Yeah. And so, yes, yeah, so that's a real, I'm, I'm really, I'm, I'm absolutely mortified that, that you had to go through what you went through to be able to identify with that. That's just the worst. But I'm, I'm glad that that, also uh, spoke to you so personally because it was a very personal thing for me. It just for me because to me my mom when I left the house I left not my mom Yeah. but for years I know me and my brother had begged her to leave begged her like let's just leave let's just and she wouldn't but I'm sorry I'm but um, oh no it's fine um, it just, it was very, when she died, it was just like, I, I told, you know, I, I told her before she died, I said, I forgive you. I know, you know, maybe you felt you had nowhere to go. I don't, I, I never, I never, I'd asked her why she left, but she never really answered. And I think my, my, my uncle or her sister, maybe my aunt, one of them had said, really, your your dad was somebody your mom had loved. I said, well, let me tell you something. My mom may have loved my dad, but it wasn't the other way around. Because I lived that I lived in the house, you know. I saw it, but it's you know I I show my kids like my my mom's picture all the time. Like, this was your grandma, and it's like, but what do you do? You know. You, you you be the good father. Yeah. That's what you do. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean I mean what do you do if you're if you're Jameson? Well you don't do the bad right. stuff maybe it for did and that's that's the one thing like I tell my wife, I said, the one thing that asshole did was show me how not to be. You know, and I pay it forward. Right. Pay it forward, pay it all forward. Right. And like I, I like I talk to my kids all the time. I said I'm down like, hey, it's okay to be upset. Just talk to me. You know, I'm here for you. You know, that's the best you can do for your kids. I try to get my daughter to watch Dark Shadows. She goes, Dad, what's this old show? <laughs> now, uh, how old is she? She's 13. She's going to be 13, sorry. To next year. Is she into other similar stuff? <laughs> okay. My Little Pony, which yeah. Wishing Tree, the, something called The Wishing Tree. I forget what it's called. Uh, you know, uh, um, she likes the Trolls movie, but um, I don't know if you've ever seen Ponyo. Um, no, it's, no. <laughs> she's into. She, my kids aren't into like what I'm into, and it's cool. It's yeah. like I'll, I'll watch what they're into to know what, to, uh, you know, to know what they're watching. And, if I, I had seen Ponyo, the police would be on their way over here. I mean, that's not a thing a fifty-year-old man says. Who doesn't have kids? No, That's, I don't know what it is, but no, I know I don't know anything about uh, it. Sorry, Ponyo is about, it's basically the Japanese version of The Little Mermaid. 
Um, oh. It's oh, it's about this little girl who comes from out of the sea and falls in love with this boy. Okay. So basically, it's a Japanese version of Little Mermaid. Yeah. Um, so that's what Ponyo is. But yeah. um, and this is, and I watched nine seasons of My Little Pony with my daughter. So, and it's like. Fluttershy reminds me of Beastmaster. She could talk to animals. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Hey, you know, if she were into Vampire Diaries, or Twilight books, or something like that, well, then Dark Shadows would be a natural thing. But, right. 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 Yeah. Uh, yeah. I can. I, yeah. Sure. That's fair. That's fair. If not, I would say start with episode seven hundred one. That's where I think everybody should start. Yeah. Is there when you? Is there an episode to you that's your all-time favorite? Like, one that, like... Oh, boy. Um, you know, it's, 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 a, it's one of the hidden jokes in the daybook is, like, the 38 different My Favorite Episodes and, like, the 95 different Greatest Episodes of Dark Shadows. And I mean them all at the time. You know, I'm like a... I'm like a, a horribly sleazy lover who, you know, tells every woman, oh, you're the love of my life. And he means it at the time. Uh, you know, he really died. So, uh, I think we went over this, you know, last week that there's, Sorry, there's yeah. the, Barnabas smashes the equipment. Yeah. I like, I like episodes where things wrap up, yeah. like what, destroy the Leviathan altar. Yeah. It's great. But dark shadows, is full of so many moments that are giant and cumulative and they sneak up on you. They're shuffled in there in the middle of episodes with all sorts of other things. So you do get reminded as you're watching the show. It's like, oh no, no this is my favorite episode. Right, what about you? My favorite my favorite episode, and this is going to sound corny to, to some, is the beginning because it's the, it's the beginning of everything. Vicky, okay. Vicky arriving, her getting off the train. It's Dan's dream. And yeah. when I did my top five, I put I put number two, number five was the bleeder valve. Number four was I forget what number four was. Number three was the Phoenix Arc. Number two was Jonathan Fred getting casted, and number one was Dan's dream. Dan Curtis dreaming of Victoria Winters. So to me, it's my favorite episode is the beginning okay so okay now i am looking back in collinsport historical society history and i am looking at uh a bunch of bloggers at the time and so this is nearly 10 years ago good good lord but this is what i said is my top 10 back then this is long before the day book okay uh, number one, episode 405, Barnabas gets bitten and cursed. Nice. Number two, episode 212, Barnabas finally released, meets the new family. Nice. Episode number three, uh, episode 364, Sarah finally visits Barnabas. Nice. Uh, episode 479, Barnabas reawakens the good man within him and he spares Jeff Clark's life. Episode 548, Barnabas withholds forgiveness from Angelique. Oh, yeah. His sin of pride asserts itself. He will regret it. Episode 1109, Ragnarok, Collinwood destroyed. Episode 1169, after curing Barnabas, Angelique confirms that she wants nothing in return. No. Episode 1196, Angelique confronts Gerard and has her power taken away. Episode 1198, Angelique having risen to the status of hero is shot for it. And episode 1245, uh, which, which uh, you know, wraps a lot of stuff up. No. So that's what I said at the time. Cool. That's, yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Let me see. Um, I can't think of any questions to ask you. Um, is there anything you want to add? Uh, only, only if if you want another musical number or you can, you can wait. I, I will describe what the musical number is. It was, it was another oil change. They tend to take a lot of time. And I imagine if Dark Shadows had been done as a Disney movie, right. as, a, as an Ashen and Mechman 
making a movie musical. I had never written a song before, never written lyrics, never written music. And if you heard my lyrics to Joanna, you would agree that I have not yet begun. But uh, I somehow imagined what the opening number of a Disney movie musical of Dark Shadows would be. Cool. And I, it, it all came in one fell swoop. Cool. Uh, yeah. And the thing is, is that Ben is a St. Bernard. Nice. Ben Stokes becomes a St. You know, he's like, that's, that's part of this is pet. Yeah. And I, and I put Quentin in as the brother yeah. instead of Jeremiah. So you could have Quentin. But yeah, I'll just, I'll tell you the, the title of the song is it's all about Josette. Nice. And it's everyone getting ready for her arrival. So I'll just say it's a thing that exists. That is awesome, man. I love that, man. That is so cool. And, that and is I so cool. That's so cool. That is so cool. I love that, man. That is awesome. Um, I want to thank you, first of all, for joining me again tonight. Thank you so Thank you. Thank you. you. Put up with it. <laughs> no, man. I I love talking dark shadows to to anyone, man. I love anyone who will listen to my ramblings, I guess. Sure. But you know, I love I love dark shadows, and I love hearing from you, Patrick. Uh, enjoy your con, your monster. I will. So have a safe trip. Um, have a great time, man. If you guys want to go get the dark shadows day book, it's at Amazon. Link will be in the description. Um, He's at the real Patrick McRae. He's on Twitter. Go follow him. And he, the Collinsport Historical Society. Thank you. Thank you so much, Patrick, man. God it, bless you. Always a pleasure. God bless you. Always Have a, a great night. You too. Man. And when you shut this off, I've got some, I've got, I've got some secret sauce. <laughs> oh, thanks.